Hello and welcome to Crushing Doubts Q&A. Uh, I'm still getting used to the technology, so now I'm going to get my uh, Instagram going. Give me one second and then I will be right with you. All right, we've got it ready to go. All right, here we are. Welcome to Crushing Doubts Q&A every Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. It's great to be back here with you guys. And of course, I'm here to discuss mind-body issues. So let's talk about what mind-body issues are. First of all, I should introduce myself. I'm Dr. Dan Ratner. I am a mind-body specialist. I'm a psychologist who uh, has strategies to change what goes on in your mind, to change what goes on in your body. So how did I get into this? Well, I had eight years of chronic everyday back pain. This started when I was 28 years old and went until I was 36 years old. And I really had no hope that it was going to get better at a certain point. And in fact, that point happened very quickly. When I first developed these symptoms, I went to a doctor thinking, oh, doctors will know what to do about this. Well, I was very shocked when I found out, no, they don't, uh, or at least they didn't then. And they really still don't to this day in many ways. And I'm going to talk about why that is and what we can do about it. I also found that it wasn't just doctors that didn't know what to do. Uh, even when I thought that, well, maybe this is a, a thing that is what's called psychosomatic, meaning that's a very misunderstood term, but it basically means something that begins in your mind and becomes very real in the body. That made me think, well, maybe a psychologist would know what to do, but they didn't know what to do either. Then I thought, well, all right, I'll go to chiropractors. I'll go to acupuncturists. I'll go to all of these holistic remedies and hope to find the answer there. What I found is that maybe some people had some parts of it, but in general, they really didn't seem to know what was going on. And this was a very frightening experience because I was I was really feeling debilitated and in incredible pain. I was having spasms every night. And I know a lot of you out there listening to this can relate to this, whether it's your back or not. It doesn't matter because if you're having a debilitating symptom, it takes over your life. And if you don't feel that you can get better, that takes over your life even more. So we're here to talk about what we can do about that. I got out of this trouble when I discovered the works of Dr. John Sarno. He was an MD uh, with NYU, and he wrote four books, as it turned out, um, describing what happens in the mind, what happens in the body, why does this happen? And I needed all of those answers. So the reason I do this Q&A is because as I was getting better, Sarno pointed this out. You need to accept the diagnosis, he said, to get better. You need to believe that, that it really is a mind-body experience and that that is reversible. But I needed to know why. And many of you, I think, feel the same way. We need to know the answers why. So I'll get into that in a second. Let me say hi to a couple of people. Uh, Jia Lang Hua, good to see you here. Rita, thank you for joining us and saying hi and for the emoji. Debbie Grubbs, good to see you here as well. And Lynn Slavensky, thanks for joining us on YouTube. There will be more people joining us, I'm sure. But let me talk a little bit about my system, because what ended up happening is I discovered Sarno, and he gave me the, the outline of how to understand things. And listen, the man saved my life. I have nothing but gratitude for him. This is not a, a critique of him in any way to say that I found that there were things that I needed to know more about. No one person can get you all the information, especially in one book or in a couple of books. And I didn't get to visit him directly, though I did get to, I had the honor of speaking with him for two minutes one time, and that was just uh, an amazing experience. And uh, I'm really, I treasure that that I got to do that. Uh, Jamie, good to see you here as well. Thanks for saying hi. So what I found is that Sarno talked about a couple of things that all were true. What I found with Sarno is virtually everything he said was true or on the way to being a full explanation, but there were certain things I needed to know more about. What he said is that a lot of symptoms come up for emotional reasons. They happen when you have an unconscious emotional experience that you don't want to know about, and a symptom comes in as a distraction. Now, he's right about that, but that's not what always happens. That's what happens with the onset and uptick of symptoms. So this is the beginning of what I call the emotions column. I have a three-column system. It got that name from when I first started working with people on these symptoms after I had gotten better, I would have them divide a sheet of paper into three columns because I came to understand there are actually three main reasons we have symptoms. The emotions column and that distraction function, that's one of them, but that's really mostly for the onsets and upticks in symptoms. The doubt column is one that I got onto really quickly and I'm glad that I did. Uh, Scotty Styles, thanks for joining us here, saying hi and sending your, your usual emojis. It's a pleasure to see you. 
Um, what I found as I thought about, uh, thought about, uh, Scotty Styles, you said, I am, it looks like you started, a, a, a to ask a question and didn't finish it. So I'll get back to you on that. But, um, when I discovered the concept of doubt, it was very important. It began with the concept of Sarno saying you need to accept the diagnosis. I knew that you had to be certain, but I wasn't certain about so much. And I wasn't certain about, for example, why did my emotions start an eight year process that never went away? In my experience, feelings come, come and go. And I'm right about that. And so I wondered, what is this? And what I found is, you know, there also seems to be a correlation between my thinking and the symptoms. And my thinking had really become very rigidly and understandably so, expecting the pain to continue. Because that's what was happening. It wasn't going anywhere. So I didn't really understand how I could get better. And I was having the that same thought process. Sarno's information started to break me out of that thought process. And that was incredibly important. But once he started to break me free of it, I got to start thinking about it. And I got to see, oh, my thinking is what's leading to perpetuated symptoms. So onsets and upticks, those are caused by those unconscious emotions and that distraction function. But in the thinking department, that's the thing that keeps things, uh, that makes things um, seemingly chronic or what I call consistently acute, always there but resolvable if you get the right thinking and change thinking. So the function of symptoms in the doubt column is protection. It's there because it's like a helicopter parent. It's afraid that you're in danger and it wants to protect you at all times. So it keeps thought processes going that can keep you uh, being cautious, being careful. But if we're doing that, we're bracing ourselves. Our whole central nervous system is bracing itself and it's expecting these things. And if you're perpetuating what's going on up here, you're going to perpetuate what goes on in here. Because if you believe in a mind-body principle, what goes on in your mind really does become real in the body. Okay, now those are the first two columns. Thirdly, I discovered a third column after I got better. After I got better, I started to feel really powerful. I started to think, wow, I feel like more powerful than I ever have in my whole life. And I started to wonder, is this something that I could use to get better? And I, I found as I looked at it that, uh, and as I explored it with other people, that the power column has a different function. And this is about um, your relationship with you. So the function of these symptoms isn't distraction, and it isn't even protection. It is communication. There is a part of you that wants to know your story, how you've suffered more centrally. And the symptoms are ultimately trying for that. They want to get that communication. They'll distract when they need to if something's really upsetting. They'll come in to protect if they need to. And a lot of times, doubt just thinks it needs to protect over and over. But once doubt is lowered, and once you figure out those emotions, what you're going to find is these symptoms are trying to communicate something to you. And if you take away all three functions, you're going to take away all your symptoms. We are human beings, so we do have symptoms uh, in an ongoing kind of day-to-day, moment-to-moment experience sort of way where they, our body can be expressing things in our mind. But if you take away those functions, you're going to be able to take away the symptoms. And that's what my system is all about. These three columns, these three functions, and knowing when to use what. There are tasks within each column. So there's kind of ways to work with these things and understand about them to get the relief you need. Now, we do have some questions coming in. I'm going to get to those soon. In the middle, as I answer a couple more, I'm going to come back and talk about the various resources that are available on my website. Um, but uh, and my website is www.crushingdoubt.org or www.crushingdoubt.com. It goes to the same place. And you can check out my resources there. But um, let's get to some questions now, and then I'll get into how we can help. One last thing I'll say before we start, though, is why is it so important to answer these questions? Because if I don't answer these questions, you end up staying in the same headspace. And if you stay in the same headspace, you will stay in the same physical space. So the whole idea is to get you comprehensive answers that you feel really good about. And if I don't answer your question to your satisfaction, don't worry about that so much because you'll just do a follow-up question. It might be t- tonight or it might, or today, depending on where you are in your time zones. Um, but if you, you just keep pursuing your answers and you work to find sources that give you good answers, and hopefully I'll be one of them, uh, or maybe even the main one, then let's get you answers. If we can do that, it changes what happens here and that changes what happens in your body. All right, let's get to some questions. 
Karen Isaacs, good to see you here. She says, I'm on edge today, but have mostly been, quote, fiercely in my own corner. I'll get to what that statement is because that's that's a that's a, a Dr. Danism. Um, lots, lots of good examples, but today anxious. My phone got water in it, acting funky, not charged, felt felt out of sorts. I hate that I feel so dependent on the phone. Everything is in it. Uh a good example of my phone. Uh, it's not allowing me to type in. Okay. So sorry about that, Karen, but, um, I like you bringing this to, you, to our attention. I'm sorry this happened with your phone, but I also wanted to validate something that, let me do two things. I'm going to validate something. Then I'll make a comment on this in terms of columns work, because every time somebody asks me a question here, I'm going to relate it back to the columns so that it isn't just an answer for them, but it's an answer for all of you. The first thing I want to say is this, this is a great example of the kind of thing that happens that people think, I shouldn't be upset about this. This isn't a big deal. But guess what? Yes, it is. And yes, it can be. And why can it be? Well, Karen, you nailed it right here. This is a great observation. I'm so happy you're saying it. I hate that I feel so dependent on the phone. Everything is in it. People could easily say, well, it's no big deal. Now, first of all, for some big people, it could be a big deal from a financial standpoint. If they lose their phone and can't replace it, it's a big deal. It sucks. Uh, and it more than sucks. It really, it impacts us. We live in our society in a way where everything is in these things. I was on a plane uh, a couple months ago and I was editing my book and the flight attendant spilled a glass of water all over my computer. And I thought, oh my God. Now I had backed up the book, thankfully, in many different places, but it still was really, really scary. And it felt like this computer was like an extension of me. And that's probably how you feel with your phone, Karen. I think a lot of people feel this way. So the first thing I want to do is validate these seemingly small things. They're not small if you think about them, because if they relate to our sense of safety and our sense of self, that's a big deal. It's like a, it's like a part of you has been hurt. And I get that. So I'll, I'll say that first. Secondly, um, let's get back to this idea of fiercely in your own corner. Fiercely in your own corner. Um, this is a statement that I, I kind of recommend as an action step. What are action steps? Once you've decided which column you're working in and understand how to work in them, understand what the symptom's all about, there are action steps. These generally are, are changed ways of thinking. They're, they're thinking that you can bring in at a given moment. Being fiercely in your own corner is one of those changed action steps. What do I mean by it? Well, everybody's in their own corner to some degree. The key word in fiercely in your own corner is fiercely because we're all basically aligned with ourselves, but we're usually not fiercely aligned with ourselves, meaning we don't really have our own backs. We're kind of in our own corner as long as it doesn't inconvenience somebody else, as long as it doesn't show too much vulnerability, as long as it doesn't show uh, elements of ourselves that we're not sure other people were like. Well, that's being in your own corner, kind of. Being fiercely in your own corner is, no, I'm going to value me like I'm my best friend. You wouldn't do it to your best friend. You wouldn't do it to your kid. You wouldn't do it to your mom. Value you just like that. And I love to hear, Karen, that you're doing that. Mostly you've been in your own corner. I think this thing with your phone has activated trauma. It temporarily brought down power. And I want you to think about why. So in the power column, one of the things that we do, there are two tasks, two main tasks, which is create your core narrative, which is really about understanding yourself in a very concise way that sums up how you've suffered so that you kind of know who you are. But the other is what I'm talking about now, which is assessing for power and adjusting. Your power got lower and you could connect it to the core narrative potentially, but mostly you just need to see, this made me feel unsafe. This made me feel dependent, all of those things. And you can remind yourself, no, 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 I'm not. I don't know for sure what your situation is like technologically, but probably your phone's backed up somewhere. You're going to be fine. This is bringing back echoes of bad feeling from trauma, which you have a lot of when things were really a big deal. And so you've got to be in your own corner there too and be empathic to yourself about what happened and give yourself space to feel bad. It's okay. I, I don't I don't like that you're feeling bad, of course, but it's okay to feel bad when that happened. When the thing happened with my computer, it felt like I had been mugged. Genuinely. Which I know sounds silly in a way, because I hadn't been. And fortunately I had it'd be even worse if I had been. But it felt that way. And I gave myself space to feel that 
as an action step. I just gave myself room for that. And that was, um, you could say it being fiercely in my own corner. It, it was developing more self-empathy. There were all kinds of ways in which I was adjusting to it. And meanwhile, I was adjusting to power and letting myself have that feeling is a way of giving myself power back. Karen, those are my comments on it so far. Let's do follow-up as needed, okay? Thank you for commenting, and I'm sorry about your phone. I hope it's better soon. Uh, I don't know if you've done this yet, but sometimes it helps to shut it off and put it in a bowl of rice. That supposedly sucks the uh, the moisture out, and then you leave it there for 24 hours, which, by the way, that sucks also. I had to be without my computer for 48 hours to make sure it was fine. Turned out it was. These things can be really tough. I, I, I hear you. Okay, Scotty Styles said, I am happy to report that my unnecessary repetitive thoughts have passed. Great. I still have unnecessary thoughts. Join the club. <laughs> but they are not repeating. Probably because I'm not fearing them, nor am I doubting them. So unnecessary thoughts will happen for any of us. Yep, just like I said, we just don't need to buy into them. That's the key. If you're buying into them, then doubt has its fish hooks in you. Uh, or not necessarily fish hooks. Some kind of hook. <laughs> it, it gets into you. And... If we don't buy into it, it doesn't happen. And that's what happened. Scotty came here. It was two weeks ago because I was off last week. And we talked about these unnecessary repetitive thoughts as doubt. And Scotty, it sounds like that was helpful. I'm not saying it was all me, but uh, hopefully that helped get you free of that. Uh, that's what you said at the time. So I'm, I'm kind of reading into that. But you said, my fear was that they would keep repeating. So fear. Fear is a form of doubt. Doubt comes in four different forms. Doubt, it comes in confusion a lack of certainty, and questions. And if you think about it, the way that I listed them, I listed them in that order on purpose. I went from strongest to least strong. Fear is the strongest doubt. It gets us really scared. Once you get past fear, okay, that's better, but you could still be really confused. No way of knowing where you're going. When you get some orientation, but you're not totally sure, that's lack of certainty. When you get more certain, but you still have some lingering questions, that's questions. That's why questions are the gold standard of doubt. We want to move in that direction. So Scotty says, my fear was they, they would keep repeating. Fear is a form of doubt, and it's a very high-level one. Eventually, they didn't. Once I lost interest in needing to change them, thereby reducing fear as well. Right. You let yourself just have that experience, and you gave yourself confidence. This will go away. We interpreted the uh, unnecessary repetitive thoughts as a symptom, and that was key. Because otherwise, it could feel like something you're doomed to, or it's just going to keep going. And then the doubt is feeding itself. I also chose to see these thoughts as a sy oh, symptom of anxiety. There we go. And look for ways to regulate using the body in order to influence the mind. Beautiful, Scotty. So, um, you know, Scotty's a, a coach in the mind-body uh, field and, and uh, does a great job. And so I know you understand these things at a high level. But this is a good example. I have to do this too. No matter who we are, we've got to think through these things these way these ways again. The, the columns, um, I built them originally for me. They were an organizing structure so that I knew I could do this, so that I, I had doubt kind of pinned to the ground in general. I could say to doubt, guess what? I got a system. I got a way of thinking about this. You're in trouble, not me. And that turned the tables. And then it allows me to do that You know, each and every time. I, I had doubt climb in yesterday about uh, my singing voice. I was like, oh, it feels like it's weaker. And I was like, nope, this sounds like doubt again. And uh, I went back in, thought about why that would be. I fought the doubt. And I'm fine. Uh, this is what we have to do. So Scotty, great work. And thank you for sharing the good news. Okay, Debbie Grubb says, I am like you, Dan, when you first started. I have hundreds of questions and I know we don't have time for all of them tonight. So I will be joining a group. Very glad to hear it, Debbie. Um, it's very natural to have tons and tons of questions. And when I I got the doubt column in my mind solidified as an idea when I was I had read Sarno, I was trying to get better and uh, decided I would go see Eric Sherman, who was a psychologist who trained under Sarno. But Eric couldn't see me at the time because I was in a different therapy. And that was his uh, that was kind of his setup in, in thinking about therapy. I was thinking, well, wouldn't it be nice if it was like a short-term like back technician uh, or a mind-body technician. I wanted a mind-body expert, not a therapist who understood mind-body experience. I wanted a mind-body expert who understood therapy, not a therapist who understood mind-body because I wanted to get right to 
getting at the symptoms, get in there. That's what I do. I, I actually don't even think of myself as a primarily a therapist. I am a therapist. I do therapeutic things, but my primary function is exactly what I wished was out there. I am a mind body expert and I know how to get rid of symptoms. If you need ongoing therapy, I actually will hook you up with somebody else because I'm engaged in getting the symptoms down. So Debbie, I'm, I'm really glad that you are finding ways to get to your questions. You're right. We won't have time, time for them all tonight. I do want to encourage everybody at these Q and A's or in the groups. It's not just when you're asking your question, you're going to get, you're going to get information from all of the questions. As long as I answer them well enough, they should be flowing into basic answers and ideas about all of these things. So Debbie, since you said you're joining the group, I just wanted to uh, put in a plug for that for people, not to sell it, but because it's a resource that does something different. And I want to highlight what that is. So on my website, again, it's www.crushingdoubt.com or, or .org. Um, you can get my various resources. I want to highlight two of them mainly though. Although I do want to say we're going to be revamping the website to get you guys even more resources on there and even more organized in what those resources are. Soon you'll be able to have a profile on there that tells you everything you've bought from Crushing Doubt, your different resources, how to download them all over again, how to access the groups. It'll all be in one central location. So I'm going to get that information to you guys soon. But the two main things that I want to highlight that are on the website since the book's not yet out. One is my teaching seminars. These are eight sessions. They're 75 minutes long each. So 12 hours of me talking about the entire mind-body experience. Why does the mind-body world talk about this this way and this this way? Because I want it all to make sense in one comprehensive system. It also outlines my column system, what those columns are, how you're going to use them. Uh, it is it, the number one source that I think brings doubt way down. My book will do that as well in a different form. But uh, the seminars have a, a, an added advantage of just, it's me. I'm right there telling you about these things. It's, and I, I make a, an extremely compelling case against doubt. So usually before people come to group, I, I encourage them, take that seminar because you'll have the language of the columns when you come into the group. It, it's not necessary, but it's very helpful. Uh, and some people actually find they get relief just from that. I also modeled those seminars after Sarno. He did seminars like that. And I thought, you know, that is a great idea. And I wish that people uh, were still doing, I wish he was still able to do that sort of thing. But I knew that somebody needed to do that. And I had a good idea of how to do it. The groups, however, while they are Q&As, they're different than this. They're Zoom calls. They're not recorded. So there is uh, confidentiality and privacy though, of course, you're sharing it with group members. But um, what happens there is different for a particular reason. And that is that there's much more give and take between me and each person as we talk. So when you ask a question and I have a follow-up, like when I was talking to Karen before, I gave an answer that hopefully was helpful to her. But in the group, I would know if it was helpful. I could, I could see how, what her response was. I could ask her questions about it. She could ask me questions about it. We get a lot further in one sitting. And so that's a huge part of why the groups are there. The groups are also there because when I started the teaching seminars, I found that people said it was great information. I feel like I, I know what I know uh, how useful this information can be. I can't wait to implement it. But then they needed actually uh, some people, many needed some help implementing it on a more regular basis. So the groups are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. You can come once a week, twice a week, three times a week, uh, though I am off one week each each month. And uh, it's Mondays, 5 p.m. Eastern, Wednesdays, 12 p.m. Eastern, and Fridays, 2 p.m. Eastern. I try to sp spread out the times for the whole world. People in Australia can come to the Monday one. Uh, people in Europe can manage usually the Wednesday one or sometimes the Friday one. People uh, in the West Coast can manage uh, hopefully all three of those and uh, East Coasters as well. So I tried to set it up in a way where people could really get access that they needed so that they could come on a regular basis and say, okay, I understand the columns, but here's this moment. How would I understand this? So Debbie, we're going to get to that. And, and uh, if people do have questions about that, please email me, dan at crushingdoubt.org. Okay, DMR LCSW, thank you for joining us here. Now, Debbie, you, I believe, had a question here. I believe I have every column, LOL. You know what, Debbie? Actually, everybody has all three columns. The columns describe how we are as people. But I think what you're saying is I have every column very active, and I get that. 
My eyes have been burning every day for the past five years. I'm very sorry. That's very hard. We will get we'll get there though. If I cry, they will burn to the extreme. Okay. We're definitely, uh, I cannot wait to dig in on this, Debbie. I'm, re I'm ready. I know what to do about this. My vision is so blurry as well. I just don't understand anymore. Okay. So you said you you have every column and everybody does, uh, especially when they first come to see me. But the place we always start, if there is doubt, we're going to start there. And Debbie, I hear doubt in what you're saying. Not surprising. Why wouldn't you have doubt? You've had this every day for the past five years. Nothing's gotten it to budge. It's very worrisome. It's very painful. It's scary. And you're not understanding. So the good news is I'm going to be able to explain why this is happening. And I'm going to be able to explain what to do about it. But the main thing we're going to need to do is start attacking doubt. The way this system works is first you attack doubt. Once you get doubt down low enough, and I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm putting the carpet before the horse there. I'm, I'm, I'm going from the assumption of once we've gotten doubt down. Debbie, we haven't done that yet. So don't worry, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to help you look at doubt. I'll get to that in a second. Once that's down, though, then we can move over to the emotions column and start getting your emotional themes organized so you can recognize when the symptoms have their onsets and upticks. But when you have a symptom that's every day, you can't even see that. Doubt is covering over everything. That's what it was like with my back pain. I couldn't find what emotion was leading to a symptom because I always had the symptom. That's a doubt column issue. So this burning every day for the past five years in your eyes, that's a doubt column issue. When you cry, that's also a doubt column issue because you're afraid that that moment of physicality makes you worried again. So there's a lot of doubt in here. We're going to uncover what else is underneath there, but we're going to start with doubt. Now, what do we do in the doubt column? There are three steps in the doubt column. Observe, articulate, and counter. Observing a doubt means to recognize when you're having a doubt instead of buying into the doubt so much that you just think it's true. That's when doubt's winning. But when you start observing it, you call it into question. That's the first step. The next step, articulate. It's just what it sounds like. Get it put into words. But I help you put it into words. What specifically? Why do you doubt this? And, you know, it, let's say Debbie says, well, it's because it's been every day. I might say to her, okay, I understand it's been every day. But if it's been every day and you've also had doubt every day, what if I told you that removing the doubt can actually get that to shift? You, have, you haven't lived a day in this experience without doubt. We're going to see what happens then. Now we're starting to get on our way. The doubt was articulated. I countered it. That's the next thing. You counter it with science and logic. Um, and actually, sometimes doubts can be about the self. That can't be countered with science and logic. That's actually countered in the power column where we work on our relationship with ourselves. The columns are all set up to give us exactly what we need to, to know. So when I hear you guys speak, I know which column is going on. I know where to work. I know what the work of the column is, and we get right to it. This is why it's different than therapy. This is informational, and it's targeted, and it goes straight after the symptoms. This is me being a mind-body expert and not more than a therapist, even though I'm also a therapist. Debbie, please do let me know if that is a good start to getting you on your way. But as we dig in in group, we're going to get there more. Okay. Scotty Styles then said, thanks, Dan. Yes to all of what you said about the doubt and fear. Fantastic. And you're doing great work. Uh, Debbie then said, I cry every day and don't know how to stop. My doubt is low one day and high the next. Okay. But you know what? Your doubt might be low in one way at times and high the next, but it's actually high all of the time about certain things, about whether you can conquer this, about whether you can understand it. Maybe listen, I'm getting to know you. So maybe it is low certain days. You'll describe that. And this is one of the advantages of group. I'll get to hear about that. But we're going to get there. I know exactly what to do. Okay. Thank you for joining us here. Please do um, ask follow up questions as needed. Susie Karen's good to see you here. And Carrie Nordling, good to see you here as well. All right. Lynn Slavensky, good to see you, Lynn. Okay. Lynn says, What are your thoughts on doing behaviors to attempt to alleviate pain, such as rubbing, ice, et cetera, that have become compulsions? Okay. So Lynn, this will probably not surprise you. Um, we've talked about this in group and, and here at the Q&A. But the, my rule of thumb is this. It doesn't matter what you do. It matters what you're thinking while you do them. So that's one phrase. Another phrase that really helps to think about is that when I think about an action and I'm going to take an action, I ask myself, is this going to raise my doubt or is it going to lower my doubt? So, um, over a year ago, I, I had 
I got a mind body foot symptom that seemed to come from an injury. Turns out it was all mind body as I expected, but I had a lot of doubt at the time because there was a physical event that, you know, made it confusing for a while. I got through that. And then what I found is uh, there was a certain point in my recovery where I was doing these foot exercises. And at first the foot exercises were extremely helpful against doubt because they were letting me do things like hop on that foot and do things that just showed me I am actually okay. That was reducing my doubt. But as time went forward, I started to feel dependent on them. They did feel like compulsions. I started to feel like, mm, I, don't, I don't know if I can feel safe without these. Well, that was a clue to me that now these exercises were raising doubt. So what did I do? I decided I was going to do a kind of hybrid. I was going to take away the exercises certain days so that I could prove to myself that I was fine without them. And I was going to let myself have the exercises certain days so I could keep proving to myself that I was fine. And I just struck that balance with myself. I kept asking the question, when is it raising doubt? When is it lowering doubt? So my thoughts on these behaviors, the question is, is it raising doubt or lowering doubt? From what you're saying, it's it's entering the phase where it's actually more raising doubt. It's it's feeding the idea that this is maybe physical or maybe partially physical, or maybe you need these things. I'd have to know more, Lynn. This is an example of in group. I would ask you these questions and we find out more. You can answer here, but of course I got to wait for you to type it in and then we see where we're at with things. But I would want to find out more. Well, what's happening in your mind about it? Ultimately, you're not going to need any of these things. In a mind-body uh, experience with my, you know, true mind-body symptoms like we're talking about, you're ultimately not going to need it. You're going to get to a place where you will conquer the doubt, you'll know about emotional onsets and upticks, and you'll get to a good place in the power column. Now, I, there's one thing I didn't say about the power column I realized. The emotions column is used for these acute symptoms, onsets and upticks. The doubt column is used for these seemingly chronic symptoms that don't budge so much or are just very repetitive. The power column, you usually don't discover those symptoms at all until you've removed doubt and understood your emotions some. But what then ends up happening is people hit a plateau in their recovery sometimes. That is a signal that there's something going on in your relationship with you. Interestingly, there's a, li there's a, a hint of doubt here because you're asking a question. There's nothing wrong with that. But this means there's a little bit of doubt there. So we got to answer that question. Once we do that, though, I think what you're going to find is these behaviors are something you're clinging to in part because you don't yet fully believe in the power of your mind to change this. And you don't believe in your full power to be able to do it. That's all power column stuff. So these are what I call level three doubts. Level one doubts are, is this mind body or not? Level two doubts are, I know it's mind body, but is my symptom harder to conquer or not? And level three is, I know it's mind body. I know my symptoms just like any other thing, but can I do it? Is this something that's going to stop me? I hear level three doubt in this, Lynn, but I want you to let me know if you if that feels right to you. I use you guys as my litmus test. I'm not a mind reader. I just know how things tend to work and these columns help me interpret and understand people. But you're ultimately the ones who are going to know. So I think these behaviors, I think one of the reasons you're asking these questions is there's some awareness you have that these are actually raising doubts probably more than they're helping. And what do I do then when that's happening? Um, I know that I want to then move away from those things, but I also know that moving away from them will be a triggering experience. The fact that I'm engaged in an activity or not engaged in an activity that then might raise doubt temporarily is something I have to work through the trigger of. When I was getting better from back pain, this was actually two years after I was better from back pain, I wanted to get back on the basketball court. I hadn't done it yet. And why not? I was a little scared. And I said to myself, now wait, why would I be scared? I already have proven this is mind-body. That means I actually can play basketball, but I treated it as a trigger. I, I got myself ready. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this, but doubt is going to go up when I do this. And I got ready for doubt to go up and I got ready to fight it. And I did it. And the first time somebody bumped into me on the court and I was okay, that made my doubt go down. So your doubt is ultimately going to come down, but it's going to go up first when you take this, take on these triggers. Lynn, please do let me know if that makes sense to you. Um, and if it got to your question and, and really answered what you needed. Okay. 
Okay, Debbie said, that was a good example. My doubt is better when the pain is down or someone is believing in me. Okay, so we're going to start tracking that doubt, Debbie. And again, this is one of the reasons the groups are so helpful. It's an ongoing way to interface with me. And I learn even more about you and how your symptoms work. So I, my what I recommend is even more on point. So we'll find out more about it. And if we get that doubt down, you are going to be so pleased at what happens when doubt starts to come down. I've seen this again and again and again. People think, I can't do it. I, uh, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. Even people who have done lots of mind-body programs. Well, if they haven't addressed the doubt, that's why it stays. So we'll get into that. Okay, Lynn Slavensky then says, yes, level three doubt makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, Lynn, I'm glad we're right on it. Uh, I'm also, I do want to say, I, I'm very pleased with my system because I, I'm always like, well, I need to make sure it's interpreting things right. But when I say back to people what I'm experiencing or, or expecting based on the columns, and based on what I'm hearing, it's usually very right on because these columns are a very accurate description of what goes on for people. I originally thought they were just an accurate description of what went on for me. But as I looked at it and explored it more, it really relates to everybody. By the way, if I ever miss a, a question, please make sure to ask it again or let me know that I missed it. I The last thing I want to do is overlook somebody because that is that can actually mirror trauma. Oh, wow. He got to everybody but me. That would be a very bad feeling, especially with somebody who's supposed to be taking care of you. So, um, or doing a good job taking care of you in, in one form. So do let me know if I missed anything. I don't think that I have so far. Okay. Jane Smith, good to see you here. Hi, Dr. Dan. Thanks for being here again. How's the book coming along? I was glad to get your newsletter last week. Uh, the book is coming along really, really well uh, in multiple ways. One is I am on the true last copy edit. And this is a joy to me because... The book is written. I don't need to think about, do I need to say anything else? Did I cover this? The topics are all where I want them to be. It's done. Now I'm just going through and, and editing for are there, you know, punctuation errors. Can I take out certain words? Can I make it smoother? Is this idea totally clear? And uh, once I implement those copy edits, I'll do one last read through to make sure it's what I want. Um, and we're set. Now, meanwhile, I'm, I'm working with a publisher on these things. Um, I'm working on the cover design. I'm working on the layout. This is when you know the book is really close to being done. So we're a couple months out from it being available, but we're very close, we're very close now. And I'm excited. Thanks for asking, Jane. And thanks for being here. Okay, Jane did have a question. <clears throat> Do you know the story of Anna O? Oh? Uh, this is a Freud uh a patient of Freud, so I do know that. And if so, can you comment on how it seems to relate to her emotions, Cal? Uh, to your emotions column. If I get the right theme, I will intuitively know it, right? Okay, then she said, I'm in the car again and hope I keep the connection. Okay, uh, hopefully you are. Then you said, said another way, if the symptoms go down, then I know the theme was right. Is that correct? If it is an emotions column theme and you hit on the emotions correctly and, th and those symptoms go down, yes, you've got it. The body is a barometer. And so when you hit on it and they go down, even if they go partially down, if they go partially down, you've got it partially right. If they fully go away, you got it fully right. Okay, but now I'll back up. So I, I did read the case of Anna O, but I actually don't remember it that well at this point. So I, I apologize, Jane, if I'm not commenting on it um, entirely correctly. What I recall about it, though, is that she was an example of somebody who had physical issues. I believe she had paralysis in uh, like one of her arms. And um, Freud, it, he, he's a really interesting guy. He had, had some uh, issues uh, and got some things wrong, but also got some things really right and was very helpful in certain ways. Where I think from a mind-body perspective, I wish things had gone differently is he was onto the idea that there was a link between the mind and the body, or at least symptoms in the body. But he went down the wrong path then at some point. He started to call it something called hysteria. Hysteria is a, a physical experience that's not a real symptom in the body. Just it, that That's how it was described. Psychosomatic issues, mind-body issues, uh, neuroplastic issues, uh, TMS, as Sarno called it, all of these different terms, they mean it is real in the body. 
starts in the head becomes real in the body. So I say to people, it's not in your head. It's from your head. That's a very important distinction. Not in your head. It's from your head. So uh, when you ask this question, if so, can you comment on how it seems to relate to your emotions column? So I, I think what ended up happening with Anna O, is, if I'm remembering correctly, is yes, there was an unconscious experience that was a big one and it led to a big symptom. That was the symptom onset. However, what continued that? Well, first of all, if that emotional experience continues and the distraction continues to be needed, it can continue for emotions column reasons. But she also was a human being. She would have been thinking about this. She would have had doubt. It would have taken over. It would have started to become a life of its own. So I would think that the emotions column led to the onset of that symptom. Now, the number one way we can bring down doubt is if we bring down symptoms. So if uh, Freud had interpreted that correctly, I can't remember what did happen in the case, but if it had gotten interpreted correctly and then the symptom went down, which actually I think there was something like that, um, then that would bring down doubt a lot because the, the patient would be able to see, oh, it really is true. There's a correlation between emotions and doubt. When you see that correlation, that pairing, that's when it starts to go down. This happened with my own back pain. Uh, I was reading Sarno. I was getting the ideas. I was starting to think, you know what? This really does maybe make some sense. But then a very interesting thing happened. I was working with a therapist at the time who I've talked about many times before. He was not my favorite therapist. In fact, my least favorite therapist. But ironically, we ended up getting a lot done because of his deficits, uh, which is a credit to me, not him. But I'm still glad I had the experience. I learned a lot in that. But what happened is there was one week where he was going away for just a week. And I, my back pain started getting much worse. Now, this was kind of important to me because for a, for a long time, my back pain would sometimes get worse, but it really never got better. It was just always there. So I wasn't getting a lot of information that suggested to me that anything could be emotional because it was always the same. But every once in a while, pain would go up. This was a time where I got wind of something where I saw it went up for a reason. Now, it was shocking to me that I would be bothered that he went away for a week. I was a grown man. I could easily handle him being away for a week, I thought. And the truth is I could. But at some level, it was also signaling something to me that was much harder, which essentially was, I don't think he cared very much about me. And I could feel that. And that hurt my, my back. And so I started to get an inkling of this. Two months later, he went away for, for the entire month of August, and my pain shot up right away again. That pairing brought down my doubt. I could see, yes, look at that. Now, the columns allow us to get different moments of understanding and conviction. Ooh, look, that really happened. So if I bring down your doubt and the symptoms start to shift around, which is exactly what Sarner described what happened, uh, he didn't describe it as in terms of doubt, but he did describe accepting the diagnosis that the symptoms start to shift. That starts to convince you, wow, this really works. So all three columns really work, and you're going to get to see them in real time. Here, we work on getting you some of the basic answers and keeping that going, and I'm educating everybody as much as I can about how these columns work and how we can understand them. But in the group, uh, and as you gather information in the seminars, in the group, you get to come and experience it. I get to take you through the given moments and say, okay, look, see what happened here? This is why that happened. And when that comes to feel really real to you, you start to believe it more. And the more you believe it, the more you feel like this is masterable. This can be described by these three columns, and I can get out of this. So that's what it's all about, guys. Uh, we're going to wrap up in a minute here, but let me just, uh, again... Uh, let people know about them on my website, www.crushingdoubt.org or .com. Uh, those, that's where my resources are. There are uh, the seminars where you can learn all about mind-body experience, and that brings down down a lot. You can sign up for the membership groups. And these membership groups, I am going to make more announcements about this, but I'm adding a particular function to the membership group that's going to be on the website. I don't know when it's going to be, but it's probably going to be about a month. And... Uh, that's going to be a place where uh, members can ask written questions like this. But the nice thing about it is I'm going to write out the answers and then they're going to stay there available to the members, these frequently asked questions. So eventually you're going to go back, you're going to be able to go back and look 
at, at doubt column questions, power column questions, questions about particular um, physical symptoms, and it'll be organized so you can look at it. So this is another reason that the group memberships can continue to serve people really well. I'll, I'll say more about it as we go. Also, if you want to sign up for my newsletter, you'll get all kinds of information about what's going to be happening. That also is on the website. Okay. Debbie Grubb says, wow, that was good. Excellent, Debbie. So glad. And I can't wait to talk with you more about it. Okay. Then Jane Smith says, thanks again, Dr. Dan. Very good to see you this week. It is a pleasure. I'm here on Thursdays, 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific. And we'll keep it up, guys. Keep your questions coming. Very important. And um, I really want to encourage you, if you have lots of questions, the membership group is not only great for coming to the group, but this other resource that I'm going to have on the website where you can see those frequently asked questions and get your questions answered each week means there's another tool for that. So lots of ways to get your questions answered. It's incredibly important because if you stay the same up here, you'll stay the same here. But if you change what's going on up here and you're confident, which I will help you be, everything changes. Guys, it has been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you next week. Okay, thanks for being here. Take care.